This short talk is the first one of a series which will take you through the basics of the vibration and sound of stringed instruments like the ones you see in this picture here. Now we'll come to instruments in later talks, but this first talk is going to be more basic than that. We're going to think about what is vibration, what is sound. Let's start with vibration. Now, any mechanical vibration requires two ingredients, and let me illustrate those for you here. I take this metal ruler here and I clamp it in a vise. Then I can immediately illustrate the first ingredient. I get hold of the ruler, I bend it this way, it will want to come back to the middle. If I pull it this way, it will want to come back to the middle. So there is a restoring force. The stiffness of the ruler makes it always want to return to this vertical position. So restoring force is our first ingredient. The second ingredient is inertia. If I take this clamp here and fix it to the top and then set it moving, straight away we see vibration backwards and forwards. And it's easy to see what's happening here. When it moves this way, the restoring force makes it tend to come back. But when it gets back to the middle, the inertia means that it doesn't stop then. Inertia means things want to carry on doing what they're doing. So it overshoots the middle, comes out the other way. Then the restoring force turns around and pushes it back towards the middle, gets to the middle, inertia makes it overshoot. And so you get this alternation between the effects of inertia and restoring force producing vibration. And the vibration happens at a certain frequency. Frequency is just the repeat rate, roughly once per second in this particular example. Now, I didn't need to have the clamp on here to make this vibrate. If I take this off and ping the ruler, it vibrates, but at a higher frequency. And we can immediately see why that frequency is higher if we think about our two ingredients. The restoring force is still the same, but the inertia is lower. The ruler has its own inertia, but it's much less massive than this uh, clamp here. The frequency of vibration is governed by the balance between the restoring force and the inertia. When inertia dominates, frequency goes down. When stiffness or restoring force goes up, frequency gets higher. So let's have the slides back. Frequency relates to something familiar to musicians because it's roughly the same thing as what we call musical pitch. High pitched notes have high frequency, low pitched notes have low frequency. We're going to see some frequencies in a moment and I'm going to plot them on a rather particular kind of scale called a logarithmic scale and that will reflect the way that musicians talk about frequencies. When a musician talks about a musical interval like a fifth or an octave, what they're telling you is about the ratio of the two frequencies. For example, an octave is always a factor of two in frequency. So we want to use a scale that makes ratios kind of front and centre. And that's the scale you see at the top of this slide. So here is frequency in cycles per second, or often known as Hertz, named after a German scientist. He's the one who discovered radio waves in the early 20th century. So I've got a scale here and you see it goes in factors of 10. 2 Hertz, 20 Hertz, 200, 2000, 20,000 or 20 kilohertz. That range covers the whole frequency spread that humans are capable of hearing. This red line here indicates the range of hearing of a young human. I don't hear as high as that these days, but when we're young, we may hear as low as about 20 hertz and up to about 20 kilohertz. I've added a few other uh, relevant frequencies here just to orient you. Here are the tuned pitches, fundamental pitches of the four open strings of a violin from the G up to the E. Here are the corresponding strings of a cello from the C up to the A. And this green line at the bottom is the range of a piano keyboard, standard 88 keys. 
as you can see, covering really quite a large slice of the whole range of human hearing. Now we're going to think about sound waves. Sound waves are pressure waves in the air and they have an important property which we see in the last ingredient of this slide. At a given frequency, sound waves have a certain wavelength. That's the length in space over which the wave repeats. And I've plotted here a scale of wavelengths corresponding to the frequencies you see at the top. So at the lowest frequency humans can hear, 20 hertz, the wavelength of sound is 17 meters, really rather a lot. Every time the frequency goes up by a factor of 10, the wavelength goes down by a factor of 10. That's this simple proportional relationship. By the time we get to the highest frequency that humans can hear, the wavelength has come down to 17 millimeters, much shorter than where we started, of course, but still much bigger than the diameter of a musical string. And that's a fact that will turn out to be very important to us in a later talk in this series. But just fix in your mind this idea of wavelengths of sound relating to the frequency. Now, here are some little videos to illustrate the idea of sound waves. This slide shows the simplest possible kind of sound wave. It's what we would call a plane wave. And the animation on the left, the little black dots are kind of representing the molecules of the air. If you follow any one black dot, it's just moving backwards and forwards. It's not uh, moving progressively anywhere. But there is a wave of density moving across the plot, maybe not quite so easy to see. So this second animation shows the, free, the pressure variation in exactly the same plane sound waves. And now I think you can clearly see waves traveling across the screen. And in reality, they'd be doing that at the speed of sound for 300 and something meters per second. Plane waves, they are idealized but there's no source of the sound here. Essentially a plane wave is what you might get if your source of sound is a long way away. Here's the simplest kind of sound source, super idealized, the kind of thing scientists like to think about. What we have here is a sphere whose radius is simply pulsating. And again, the black dots represent molecules of air in a schematic way. And there are circular in the diagram, spherical, waves spreading out from it. And again, it might be easier to see that in this pressure wave version in the other animation. So that's the simplest kind of sound source. A pulsating sphere doesn't look much like a musical instrument, but we'll see in a later talk that this is a very important kind of sound source. Now, the most characteristic property of waves of any kind, including sound waves, is something which is called interference. So here we've got ripples on a pond. Now you can see roughly what's going on. There's one set of ripples that are coming from the lower right hand side of the plot. There's another set of ripples that are coming from the upper right hand side, roughly at right angles. Those two sets of ripples simply pass through each other so there are times when they add together and make an extra big ripple and there are times when they cancel each other out and that leads to this sort of quilted pattern that you see in the middle which is say known by physicists as an interference pattern now here's an example of that remember that pulsating sphere we had in the previous slide well here are two pulsating spheres both simultaneously synchronized but they're quite a long way apart compared with their wavelength. So each one sends out spherical waves like the ones we saw. But once we get out here into the sound field, we're receiving sound from both the sources. And sometimes they add up and make a loud sound at high pressure. Sometimes they cancel. The white lines are places where the sound from one source is exactly cancelled by the sound from the other source. This ability of sound waves to cancel 
is going to be really important. It's, for example, the principle of uh, sound reducing headphones that maybe you have. So, what happens if we put those two vibrating spheres closer together? So, these are the same two spheres. We set those going. This is two pulsating spheres. They're now closer than a wavelength to each other. And what do you see? Well, you see essentially the same picture that we had when we only had one pulsating sphere. The two things just add together, but they can't cancel. They're always too close together for the two things to cancel. And so two pulsating spheres very close together is really not very different from one pulsating sphere. However, if we reverse the phase so that one is going out while the other is going in and then they reverse, we get this kind of thing. So again, there are two pulsating spheres close together, but one is sucking while the other is blowing and then conversely. And this produces something quite different. And you can see what we've tried to do here. I mentioned sound reducing headphones before. That's what we've tried to create here. These two pulsating spheres are doing their level best to cancel each other out entirely. On the horizontal line through the middle of this picture you can see there's always a white line and that's because anywhere on that middle plane they do exactly succeed in cancelling each other out. You're always exactly the same distance from both the spheres and they've got opposite signs so they always cancel. Elsewhere in the sound field, it's much weaker than it was when we only had one sphere pulsating because there is some cancelling, but nevertheless there is some sound, but it now has a directional pattern. It's strongest in the directions that are well away from this middle plane, but then there is no sound at all. There is silence if you're listening along here. And this is a kind of sound field, it's called a dipole source. And that will be important to us in later talks. So let's have a quick summary of what we've covered in this lecture. We've seen that vibration is a balance between restoring force and inertia, or equivalently you could describe it as a balance between mass and stiffness. Sound consists of pressure waves travelling through the air at the speed of sound. Each frequency of sound has a particular wavelength of those sound waves. Different sources of sound produce waves which add together to make the total sound field and they combine into these things called interference patterns because they may add up or they may cancel out and that can result in complicated sound fields and again that is something that will be important to us later on. In the next talk in this series, we'll look a bit harder at vibration.